Okay, let's start. So good morning, everyone. Welcome to the summer lecture series. I'm Dr. Yuan Chan from the Office of Intramural Training and Education. And it's my pleasure to have the opportunity to introduce Dr. Anna Nicolas, who became the first Latina scientific director at the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities and at the NIH in November, 2017. And prior to coming to NIH, Dr. Nicolas was a professor and behavioral epidemiologist in the Department of Medicine, Division of General Internal Medicine at the University of California, San Francisco for 27 years, where she served as the director of the UCSF Center for Aging in Diverse Communities. She obtained her PhD and MPH degrees from the University of California, Berkeley, and her bachelor degree from Pomona College. Today, she will tell the story of her st career in science, highlighting her work on developing effective social behavior interventions to address health disparities and achieve the intended health outcomes, while at the same time collaborating with Dr. Anita Stewart to create a theoretical framework and scientific tools for studying the intervention process. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Napolis. Thank you, Dr. Chun. I appreciate that introduction. And um, so now I've been introduced. Welcome, everyone. And thank you for giving me this opportunity to share a little bit about my path here and my background and answer any questions you might have about what, what it's like to do research and be a scientific director, as well as um, next steps. So uh, briefly today, I'll be going through my road to scientific director. And that's a picture of me backpacking in New Zealand. Um, my research, and this is a picture of one of the Latino surveying cancer support groups, uh, community partners that I did uh, a lot of my career, uh, a lot of my research uh, with throughout my career. And then I'll speak a little bit about the transcreation framework that was really rooted in all those experiences of working with communities to develop effective behavioral interventions. And so first of all, I'll talk about me. And you might be wondering what um, a scientific director at NIH really does. And it's really a combination of these three areas. And one is we do management of a program of intramural research. So that's the research that's actually conducted internally by the institutes and centers. And then, so as a result, we're doing all the background management and overseeing infrastructure and so forth, as well as developing the science. So really defining the scientific direction of our intramural program, um, what our ultimate goals and mission statements are, and what the values are that we bring to the table when we're doing our research on minority health and health disparities. And ultimately, the underlying framework and basis for all that we do is teamwork. We work very much in collaborative research teams that are interdisciplinary, and it's really a strength of what we do in terms of population health and epidemiology and social behavioral sciences. So a little bit about me. Um, I came from, uh, my parents were both immigrants from Jalisco, uh, Mexico. They were from small rural towns in Mexico, and really my um, my parents had no, lacked the benefit of an education. My mom went to the third grade. This is um, my father and my, one of my daughters who is now a, an adult, she's 27, but she, um, my father was really a role model for me because as I mentioned, he was, a, he was a, uh, the oldest in a family of 14 children. And he was one of those unaccompanied, unaccompanied minors that came to the US to work because um, he needed to raise money to help support his family and siblings. And so, um, but that began for him, as I said, he never went to school, a journey where he really rose in terms of what he was able to accomplish in his life. And it was all self-driven where he taught himself how to read and, read and write in both English and Spanish. And he became a, you know, a hardworking tool, dual job um, breadwinner that ended up uh, creating um, really a good standard of living for us in terms of you know, just the fact that we never needed uh, for food or sustenance or, and he provided for a college education for the three, for the three of us, my two siblings and I. 
And my academic journey started in, a, in San Bernardino County, which is where I was born. And it's a very racially divided, um, really socioeconomically stressed, I think, neighborhood, and it was then, or, or town. Um, and it really, um, I think that had a, a strong influence on me. And then I had a rude awakening when I went to Pomona College, which is um, a top tier private school and um, just really culture shock. So it was um, very challenging academically. I learned, um, I thought coming from a not very high quality high school that I was an excellent writer. And I found out very differently when I got to Pomona College uh, from my instructor in English. And um, so I had to really, really retool and work hard on my writing skills. And then I was able to go to Cal, which was much more diverse and definitely much more, I feel, welcoming and spend, um, and also challenging in that um, I was exposed to, um, and, and I guess it was much more diverse, which is what I really enjoyed and what I loved. Um, and then if you look at my career path, starting at the bottom, I obtained a bachelor's in psychology from Pomona. I uh, received my MPH at University of California, Berkeley. And then I took some time off because I didn't really have um, a clear path in terms of my research focus, which I felt I needed to have before I went back for a doctorate and knowing that I did want to go back eventually. And I worked in the private sector as a disability management specialist where I was providing vocational rehabilitation benefits mandated by, um, by workers' comp law at the time. And so my caseload was 98% Latino men who had been injured in their due to the physical nature and strenuous nature of their jobs. So that was a very, um, uh, a very eye-opening experience for me in terms of my education and um, the challenges faced in vulnerable populations. And then I became a project director at University of California, San Francisco, where I was able to work full-time and still consider a degree in, in PhD in epidemiology at UC Berkeley, which I finished and then uh, rose up the ranks from assistant professor to full professor before coming here as a scientific director. And so you look at this path and you say, well, that's a pretty straight line, you know, forward and upwards. And um, it's not so straight. There were many setbacks, many that you have probably experienced. And here are some, uh, only a few. Um, I did experience racism, sabotage in my master's program. I was originally, in an education uh, major, a master's in education evaluation, found out from another professor that my mentor wanted me out of the program. I'll never know why, um, but I was lucky enough to be um, picked up by another um, mentor who convinced me to go into public health, which, which set my career going forward. You know, I, I had financial stress as a primary caregiver throughout my educational pursuits. I had horrible imposter syndrome. Um, I went through a divorce uh, for a number of reasons, largely because I was the primary provider and I had the stress of taking care of my uh, two children at the time, as well as um, my spouse at the time, which wasn't um, easy to do on top of working and going to school full time. And, um, and then there were many microaggressions along the way. And so going through that whole educational experience and also my time at UCSF, which is a top tier you know, medical school, um, there were many myths that I had that I had internalized along the way. Um, and these were that I'm not good enough, that I can do it alone, that asking for help reflects weakness, that it's better to stay under the radar, that I will never succeed, why should I ask? They will just say no. And I'm the token Latino. I don't really bring much to the table other than you know, my, my minority and ethnicity um, status. And what that created for me, if I knew that if I wanted to succeed and not just um, professionally and academically, but also internally in terms of what I wanted to accomplish in life and what I viewed as fulfillment in life, there were three life rules I developed. And they were that if you don't go after what you want, you'll never have it. 
if you don't ask, the answer will always be no, no, and you'll never move forward. And then if you don't step forward, you'll always be in the same place. And so re really these three life rules have become uh, the underlying uh, tenets of how I live my life and the things that give me hope when I'm faced with challenges. And so what I did, and I, I went through this internal kind of um, self-reflective process that I think everyone should go to, go through, not just um, researchers, it's just important for life, is to develop really this personal narrative. And for me, it was critical for me to, to address some of the internalizations um, uh, and the negative um, stories that I had developed for myself. And so I, I quickly learned and identified that my assets were that I can handle setbacks. I had a proven record of that. I am someone who can be counted on when the stakes are high and the likelihood of success is unknown. And I'm willing to take those risks and it's definitely a strength. I have integrity and I live by it and I show it. I inspire loyalty and commitment. And this I learned by asking others how they viewed me. And it's really important to do that regularly. And because I wasn't aware of that strength. And I believe we're in this world to help the voiceless and disenfranchised. And that became my narrative. And so that's how I describe myself. That's how I make decisions about where I wanna go and who I wanna be always. And so I would encourage you um, to really think about that narrative. What is your path? What's your story? Create your own narrative. Take the time to do that now. Take the time to start it today and own it because you're unique. And unless you're, you have that, um, you know, you can wander and be a little bit lost and it really becomes your guiding post. So now I'll talk a little bit about my research. Again, the, this is a support group. This is one of my long-term, uh, the woman in red with the red sweater, my long-term research uh, partners uh, that's in a community-based research or a community-based or service organization in the Mission District of San Francisco um, that is really the only Spanish-speaking services uh, for Latino cancers offered in that area. And so we began working very early on, working together in um, my career. And for me, the initial driver was, um, you know, as I said, my parents were from Mexico. They weren't, um, my, they didn't really speak English very well initially. And so I was a translator for much of their healthcare. And it really drove in me this emphasis in my research career to develop models of what culturally competent and effective healthcare um, services look like for vulnerable populations. And so that drove me to working with a colleague, a long-term colleague, Anita Stewart, to develop these measures that were standard and rigorous and validated across um, uh, African-American, English and Sp Spanish-speaking Latinos and whites. And we really did a lot of uh, qualitative work first to identify the domains that are important to these uh, varied and diverse ethnic groups uh, in terms of the quality of their, of their care from their own, you know, from patient percep perceptions. Um, and then what we found in applying those measures is that um, English and Spanish speaking Latinos reported the worst interpersonal process of, of care on all the measures except for discrimination due to race and ethnicity in which African Americans reported the worst. And we were really one of the first, because um, this is an old study, uh, one of the first really testing these quality of care measures and looking at measures that were specific to the needs and um, preferences of a diverse set of patients. And so we found also that patient-centered decision-making was strongly related to satisfaction in all groups. And then we went on um, working with our director at the time, um, who is our director now, I mean, uh, who was my, um, my PI at the time. Um, I, we, we began a, a study looking at errors of communication because I, would, I was interested in the quality of care for limited English proficient patients. And we found, we did a, we used a mixed methods, qualitative and quantitative methods. And what we found is that 29% of the text units, so those were uninterrupted segments of speech, um, had errors of translation. And this is language translation from English to Spanish, um, from Spanish to English, I mean, and vice versa, English to Spanish. 
um, where the provider was English speaking or limited Spanish speaking. And, um, and on average, there were 27 errors per visit. And we know that most of these visits, right, are around 15 minutes. So that is really a high error, error per visit rate. And what we found, we also categorized the errors in terms of their clinical significance, in terms of jeopardizing the quality of care or leading to poor outcomes of care. And 61% were categorized by three, by two independent physicians as um, being more serious errors. And those usually involve things where the interpreter substituted what the physician or patient said or added things that weren't um, uh, actually vocalized by either the patient or the clinician. And so we found that this video med medical interpretation and in person, we compared three modes of interpretation, uh, interpretation by a professional interpreter via video, uh, in person by a professional interpreter, and then ad hoc interpreters that were untrained and just drawn off, uh, for example, a ward, uh, a ward clerk or someone of that nature. And what we found is that um, and the video, the professional interpreter, regardless of whether it was in person or by video, had equal accuracy, but they were much better than the ad hoc, as you can imagine. And so this at least gave preliminary evidence because there was very little evidence to support the need that we that we really need to be uh, uh, stepping up our game and providing professional language interpreter services for um, non limit non English proficient uh, patient populations. And so then from there, um, I, I began working in the area of cancer, doing a lot of outreach and with community organizations to promote cancer screening in a community randomized trial. Um, and so, and then from there, um, we did these qualitative uh, interviews because we were trying to, what we, working with the partners, we quickly uh, deduced that there was very little for Latino, Latinos and Latinas in terms of what to do after they were diagnosed with cancer. And it was really a gap in services as well as a big gap in research. So we did qualitative interviews and we found that for these Latinas, there was an overwhelming sense of fear that they were dying. You know, it was a death sentence when they got the diagnosis and really a loss of control because most of them because didn't understand um, what to expect from their care or treatment. Um, you know, the explanations were either de uh, delivered in English or were high literacy level and they couldn't understand them or medical jargon. Um, there was a lack, as I mentioned, of culturally and linguistically care, uh, appropriate care and a lack of social support because they wanted to protect their families um, and didn't want to share their what they were going through and lay that burden on their kids and their um, and their spouses and other family members and friends. And so we also did the first population based survey using uh, tum tumor registry cancer tumor registry data and uh, looked at what were the predictors of better self rated health and found that this feeling of control over the cancer experience and how to manage it was really associated with better health. And so that preliminary work and working with our community partners led us to development of an intervention. And I'll go through the framework that eventually evolved out of that experience. But the intervention was basically the, how to do it. A lot of the content was these coping skills training plus a peer support, which meant it was delivered by a Latina cancer, breast cancer survivor who was about three years out at least from her diagnosis and um, provided the support and also the intervention, the training on the coping skills. And it was a very rigorous, um, you know, manualized intervention. And then we hoped that that would in, improve coping self-efficacy and support, which would ultimately lead to improved quality of life and reduce distress and anxiety. And so it actually worked. And we found this is one of the women that went through our program that the that she said, because we debriefed um, the participants as well as the uh, interventionists and the program changed me because it put me in higher spirits, made me happier and helped me think positive thoughts so I could push forward and fight. And you can see that they had um, definitely felt more of a command and control over that cancer experience. So out of that, we ended up doing a couple of randomized trials. We looked at both urban settings and rural settings in, um, in very low income breast cancer survivors who were Latinas and Spanish speaking in the communities listed. 
Um, we also did a pilot study uh, and adopted some of it for a telehealth platform in rural low-income women. Uh, and these were mostly white women. And we also went on to start building some mobile phone apps and doing pilot tests for low-income uh, breast cancer survivors that integrated some of these components as well as a component on physical activity to reduce the risk of recurrence. And so this is just some outcomes from the uh, two-month pilot study we did with, um, with M Health and telephone coaching, where we developed this app here to encourage them to walk. As, and uh, we can, you can see it improve fatigue, health distress, and emotional well-being, and increase the knowledge of their recommended follow-up. And it actually increased their average daily steps by almost uh, by about 1,300 steps. So, um, and then I left and came to NIH. So I never um, went on to do a larger trial of that study, but it could still happen. And so what I wanna turn to now um, briefly and what's left of the time is go through this transcreation framework and I'll just be able to give you broad strokes, but I, we have published articles that lay all this out in detail. Um, but the, the underlying um, experiences were that we wanted to advance scientific knowledge about you know, what creates these disparities and then translate that into interventions to reduce disparities, right? So for an example of some of the work I showed you, you know, we found that this loss of control and this fear and not knowing what to expect. So really needing the information and the skills to manage the cancer diagnosis and treatment and survivorship were what we were trying to provide in this behavioral intervention. And we know um, Larry Green, who is an implementation scientist, has demonstrated and others have too, that it takes about 17 years on average to translate 14% of the evidence to patient care. And that is really not acceptable because all those research dollars are pretty much uh, to large part federal investments. And that means our taxpayer money, you know, that we're not getting a great return on our investment. Plus it's not really achieving the intended outcomes which is to improve patient and population health. And so um, we looked at these standard translation models because you might be asking, why did we need to develop one specifically uh, for health disparities and behavioral interventions? And what we found is um, that these, these models are research centered. They focus on what we call internal validity. So they're very restrictive in terms of eligibility criteria. Like if people have comorbid conditions, they can't be enrolled, for example. And so they don't really test protocols as they would be delivered in real world settings. And so it really emphasizes the fidelity to the original intervention. And fidelity means you're sticking to the way the program was intended to be delivered and designed. Um, for example, you, to, you, that you strictly follow the manual and the components of that intervention. And there's very limited community involvement from the onset. And um, it overlooks the real world settings. And as I've said, it takes too long. And so the underlying premise of, of our framework is that if we start in the disparities communities, we start in real world settings, we include community and local resources and planning the intervention and designing the intervention and the study. We use rigorous scientific methods in those, in those settings, but we do have to adapt the methods so that they're practical uh, for community-based settings that may have more limited resources. We expand the types of evidence, and I'll get into these in detail, a little more detail. And we incorporate ideas, uh, success stories, and um, best practices from local programs. And then we want to leave something in those community communities by building capacity to implement not only our program, but other programs that are similar or can be built on those uh, programs. And so just a, a definition, transcreation comes from the marketing um, area industry. And it really, the definition that's commonly used is that it, uh, transcreation involves um, creating messaging and content that are developed or adapted for a given audience to resonate in local markets and deliver the same impact as the original. So you're taking content, marketing content and adapting it for a new audience. So it has the same um, outcome, but it still connects with that audience. Similarly, our intervention research, we, we adopted this term transcreation because it hadn't really been used in the context of intervention research. 
to, to define it as planning and delivering interventions to reduce health inequities so that they resonate with your targeted health disparity community while achieving the intended health outcomes. So parallel definition. So it's a seven step process. The first is you identify your partners, your community partners or healthcare system partners or otherwise, and you develop the infrastructure for, doing the, the, for developing the intervention and testing the intervention. You specify, you want it to be theory based. So you look at the behavioral theories and find one that fits and adapt it if needed. And you identify the program inputs, you design the intervention prototype, you design the study methods and measures, and then you build community capacity and you deliver the transcreated program doing a thorough process evaluation. So you really have a good understanding of what worked and what didn't that will inform uh, further testing and dissemination of that program. So I'm gonna briefly go through each of these steps very briefly. <laughs> Um, you know, in the first part, and this is what's the critical point here is you start at the beginning, which is you identify the communities, uh, partners in your area uh, that are interested in your specific health topic, right? And so we created these alliances. Um, at the time, it was at UCSF, so it was all Northern California. It was all California, really, because we expanded to Southern and Central, the Central Valley of California to reach more of the rural Latino populations. Um, but we created these partnerships and a lot of it for me was cold calling uh, personally partner uh, to develop the partnerships and the relationships um, and then having meetings and involving them in the whole grant writing process initially, which a lot of investigators do not do. They go to the community partners once they have the funding and um, the project's already written and defined and it's not ideal from my perspective. So then you specify theory. And so for us, we chose social co cognitive um, theory, which, uh, and this is the model that I presented. Um, and you can look into social cognitive theory, but it's a behavioral theory. And uh, we were tapping on the constructs of um, social support and really creating efficacy through skills training and uh, the regulation, self-regulation. So giving them feedback on their performance on the skills and then that that would lead to mastery and improvement of those goals and improved outcomes. And then in step three, and this is a unique part of the model, which I think other investigators don't do very well, which is we looked at community best practices. So we identified a model that I'll briefly uh, mention um, from the community that it was a peer support model that we adapted. And then we looked at the scientific literature um, for coping cancer coping skills training and uh, where was the evidence in terms of what worked. And then, uh, as I had mentioned, we had done all the preliminary work and we did new work in the specific communities with survivors advocates and also clinicians, which I should add there, actually. And we had a community advisory board. And so the community best practices, this is a step that's really, really important, is uh, we found uh, this model, Las Angelitas, uh, Ciclo de Vida was a community partner. You can go to their website and look at their services. But this was a one-to-one -one peer support model where they provided individual, individualized support. They provided information on the surgery and treatment, and they linked them to community resources as, as well as providing social support. And then the, the evidence-based intervention we identified um, was developed by Christy Graves, who is now here at George Washington University. Um, it was based on social cognitive theory, and there's a set of skills here we worked on that included relaxation, cognitive restructuring, communication skills, asking for help, and those types of things, and then goal setting and self-monitoring. And these were all theory-based and evidence-based. And then the issue though was that, that for this particular intervention, it had been delivered by psychologists or psychology interns in comprehensive cancer centers and it had only been tested in white women and higher educated white women. So we had to go through a strenuous and rigorous adaptation process. And the formative research really helped with that. And I would not skip that step where we identified their needs. And then based on these needs, we divide, we designed the intervention, right? So these were some of the needs. Uh, and then there, there were more that we identified, but there's a direct relationship, the, the peer support counselor intervention and the components. And, um, and you can see that, you know, they, they had difficulty expressing needs, 
the counselor would model those expressive behaviors and reinforce them uh, and they do role playing, for example. And so step four, we designed the intervention, we developed manuals. Uh, first, we got, the, we got the original manuals, we requested them from the creator of the evidence-based intervention, and we extracted the core components of the best practices, and then working with our community partners, very much hand in hand, we iteratively went back and forth and blended those um, with input from the community. And so we had to go through a lot of simplifications because we were working with a low literacy, uh, non most, or mostly limited English speaking population, simplifying the terminology in the worksheets, um, emphasizing their cultural strengths and resiliency. Um, it, that it was delivered by the peer because we had identified transportation as an issue in our qualitative work early on. Um, the peer traveled to the client and we paid, you know, we paid the interventionist to do that. Um, and then, so we paid her, her time to deliver the intervention as well as, as a travel time to clients. And then we added communication skills with family because in the evidence-based intervention, there was nothing on how to communicate with your families and how to ask your physician questions, which are two big areas that are very culturally salient um, for Latinas. And then we did a rigorous translation and everything was reviewed by the CAB, our community advisory board and the community partners and everything was low literacy. And we had visual, uh, we had videos, for example, uh, in the second RCT that were, that went through how to do the deep breathing, how to do the cognitive reframing. And those were in Spanish and they were low literacy. And it was, you know, with people that looked like them, um, like us, I should say, and oops, sorry. So, um, so, and these were just the components of the intervention and you can read if you're interested. Um, I do have a website that has all these materials. So you can um, either look, it's, it's at UCSF under Nuevo Amanecer because that's where the resources were originally developed. So, um, you know, in step five, we had, uh, we, we had meetings with the CAB and the community partners to really design the study. So what would our um, control group look like? And we had a preliminary idea going in, but, you know, randomization was problematic and we had to sell it to the communities. And, and for ethical reasons, we decided to give everyone, offer everybody the intervention, but we had a waitlist control group. So the study lasted six months and once the final assessment measures were, um, were, were conducted uh, at six months, we offered the program to women who, who had been asked to wait for the program. And that allowed us to do the randomized comparison between women who had received the program and women who had not at that point. And we identified patient reported outcomes. So outcomes that were important to the, to the participants, pre-tested those. And then um, we, there's a human subjects orientation training program that we were able to get our IRB to accept. So we had to kind of uh, justify that because some of our interventionists who, and recruiters um, were not strong in computer um, literacy. And so we offered it in person ourselves using the materials and there's a website there if, if you're interested in that resource. So the, these are all things that you learn when you start working in the community. But this is basically, you can tell it was a rigorous design we were able to do in a community setting, which can be challenging, um, but we had great partners. That's all I can say. And we had a great team and it makes all the difference in the world. You know, so here's a schema that women received the program over three months. It's a, it was an eight to 10 week program. And then they were monitored for another three months and we had three assessments, one at baseline three months and six months. And similarly for the control group, they, um, they had an assessment three times, baseline three months and six months, but they were offered um, actually after the three months, uh, which was assessment that counted the post uh, intervention assessment that we used as a primary outcome, the way we designed the study. So step six is building community capacity. And this was really important to us. So we trained community recruiters and interventionists. We hired directly from the community partners and the communities they serve. Um, they went through a rigorous uh, training to learn how to de develop the intervention. So, I mean, how to deliver the intervention and, and how to do recruitment and how all the human subjects uh, trainings and so we built that core capacity and we offered the training not only to the women that were participating in our 
in our study and, and serving as recruiters and interventionists, but we offered it at, widely to the community organization. The only thing we asked is that they not implement any of the training, you know, any of the program components until we were done with the study, which I agreed to do. But everyone who wanted the training received it at the community organizations. Um, and they received all the materials and they have access to everything. And then, uh, so these are just, um, I won't go into these in detail, but it's just the, the content of what, you can tell that we did some rigorous training with not only the recruiters, but also the interventionists. And the training um, was delivered by myself, my project director, and, um, and also my main, two of my main clinical partners who were a clinical, a Latina, Puerto Rican uh, clinical psychologist and a, and a master's level social worker who was also Latino. And then um, in step seven, we delivered the intervention and monitored the implementation. And so we had them track the delivery of the program, how much travel time, how long the sessions lasted. We had um, a couple of questions at the beginning of each session that asked about the content of the prior session to assess their, their mastery of the material, the participants' mastery. And then we actually recorded some of the sessions and did ratings of fidelity, so how well they adhered to, adhered to various um, aspects of the compo components of the intervention and the manual. And then we had a lot of qualitative debriefing interviews with the community staff and participants, as well as a participant satisfaction survey at the end. And so this is really critical, again, to inform your next steps. And just a quick summary, what we found um, in the first trial, and where our, which was with newly diagnosed Latinas, we found that it improved, and these are the black font um, outcomes, improved physical well-being, emotional well-being, and overall quality of life. It decreased their breast cancer concerns, depressive symptoms, and somatization. And then in the second trial, which was women at any stage of survivorship, um, so it wasn't as an acute, um, I guess, need for a program, but they were definitely able to demonstrate that their ability to relax at will improved and their anxiety levels went down. So more general findings rather than breast cancer specific, which you would expect because they were further out from um, their diagnosis. And then um, the other thing is because when I had a hard time getting these grants funded, I was on the extramural side when I did a lot of this initial work. And um, you know, one of the main critiques I, I received from the reviewers was that I would never be able to keep women this vulnerable in a randomized trial uh, for six months. And so we were really proud that we had a 95% six month retention rate. Again, I attribute that to the strong community partners and our staff and the strong communication and relationships that we had with them because they were really responsible for keeping people in the program and very responsive to the needs uh, of those participants. And they, it was a vulnerable group. Um, like I think it was around 80% had less than a high school education and about that had experienced financial hardship and participant mastery was high of the material. Peers delivered the program with good fidelity to the manual and 93% said it helped them cope with breast cancer quite a bit and extremely well. So really, really um, some good outcomes there. And I wanna bring this to your attention because I know you're starting and you're early in your careers, but when you think about intervention development, because for me, no matter what type of study I'm doing, whether it's secondary data analysis or anything else, I, my question is always, how can this inform whatever we can do to make it better, right? And I think, um, and this is a, a really interesting article that um, Ankin, Dr. Ankin defines, a, she says the intervention development process is incomplete until an intervention is optimally efficacious and implementable with fidelity by practitioners in the community. Right, And so that really is a high bar, but that's the bar that we should be striving for if we want to reduce health disparities and reduce um, and improve minority health and improve health equity. So I'm going to take you back, circle back to, I started with um, self-reflection and my path and how I got here. And you need to discover that for yourself. You need, you need to identify, you know, when you're reading the literature, keep a journal, you know, when you're reading about science, and really track what is, you know, what are you finding in the literature, scientific literature and research 
that energizes you intellectually and stimulates you and challenges you. Because sometimes that initial research question can take you anywhere. You know, for me, it was like, how do I develop programs that are more responsive to underserved communities? And then more specifically later, Latina breast cancer survivors. And that became my, my, my goal in life. And then also, just as importantly, know what re-energizes your being and remember to live life. And I, I stress this because it's so important. So you want to have other career pursuits and other life pursuits that balance those career pursuits. And so for me, that has been hiking and backpacking. These are my daughters. These are some of the backpacking trips we've taken. And, um, and again, I hope that inspires you to, you know, to do things and they don't necessarily have to cost a lot of money, but, um, but they, you know, that, that you do whatever it is that, that keeps you energized and to really never stop learning about your field, you know, whatever areas interest you scientifically about yourself, that self-reflection process is really important. That narrative um, is your basis, but it, it, you know, it's, a, it's an evolution and a work in progress. And then I'd say also about the world. And for me, it's really nature. It's how I interface with nature that's really driving a lot of the principles and what I do these days as well. So these are some ways um, to contact NIMHD. There's my email. And um, this is a website where all those materials about the program and all the publications are. And you can find everything there, including the surveys, the program manuals, uh, if you're interested, and, um, and just a wealth of information there, the training materials as well. And I'm going to stop sharing now. And we have about, um, I think, 15 minutes for questions. Let me, OK, I think. Okay, I'm back, right? <laughs> okay, great. Okay, um, there are comments. Um, oh, okay, I'll, I'll just start at the top. Uh, Marisol asks, what do you recommend undergraduate students do if they're interested in participating in this type of work, um, i.e. cultural competence? Um, I would say, you know, reach out to investigators. Don't be afraid, you know, that are doing this work and, and do short, you know, just because people are very busy, you have to be persistent, so they may not respond right away. But just, um, you know, send them, send them a little bit about either your, you know, your CV, whatever your resume, uh, so they know who you are and say, this is an area you're interested in, you just want to talk briefly for 10 to 15 minutes and, um, you know, just ask them about, um, about their research a little bit. And usually people are willing to do that. And it usually goes for more than 10 or 15 minutes. So I would just encourage you to reach out to people. And then also the literature um, is a strong, I would make sure you, you have your questions prepared based on things that, you, that have come out for you out of the scientific literature or um, practices in the community that are, that are, you know, that are promising. Um, okay, next, um, it was a pleasure to share my journey. Um, Penelope asks, um, what would you suggest the ne next steps for research, uh, research path in disparities in minority groups would be? Um, what options are there in the US to follow this pathway? Um, and I'd say the best, the best thing again is to look at the, um, I don't know if you mean, I guess you mean careers, right? Um, one thing you can do is, is really look at, um, you know, contact different people who are health, 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 public health practitioners. So departments of public health are good sources and not just only academic settings, you know, and then there are other types of researchers, which are more health services researchers, which if you're interested in cultural competence of healthcare and quality of healthcare, um, those, are, those are the types of researchers you might wanna to talk to. And then just start looking at websites. Um, there are a lot of websites that can offer information on public health careers. There's a um, um, My IDP website um, that can help you identify skills and career paths that was developed by a consortium of private and public and academic sector um, organizations that I would recommend um, to do that skills assessment and help you maybe chart some of that. What are the main challenges in developing a behavioral intervention? Um, for me, because of, that's from Penelope, because, because of the type, because I'm so community-based, it's really um, being considerate and practical. 
So being considerate of what the community needs and wants um, and making sure that your research project fits into that. And then the second thing would be making sure it's practical. So you may have to bend the rules a bit in terms of the scientific rigor, but there are ways to do that and still maintain rigor so that it's a, it's a, it ends up being a really quality scientific product. So I think those were the biggest challenge, challenges. Um, how did you get over imposter, imposter syndrome? Okay, I, that's from Sam, Samya. And um, that's a great question. And I have a slide which I didn't include, but um, the best way is to talk about it. You know, and one is develop mentors um, and early on that care about you as a person as well as your career. And um, a good mentor is one who recognizes your potential before you even do. And that really happened to me because that's how you overcome imposter syndrome because they help you with it. And also talk to your peers about it. But those social networks and, um, and also just practicing, you know, practice selling your goods, selling who you are, selling the value that you bring to the table. You know, so create those narratives, what that looks like. Uh, don't be afraid to advertise your accomplishments. Practice that. It's not easy, but do it. <laughs> it, it makes a world of difference. It, it gets easier as you go along. Um, I was wondering if you could speak, this one's from Timothy, um, more on early career and academic advice, best practices for early career scientists and community health, um, implementation science, sorry, it's jumping around. Um, how do you build traction between policy, academia, and community? Boy, that's tough. I think what um, I would look at the people that are doing it. Again, look at the success stories. So there are some very, Barbara Israel, Ken Wells is another person um, who are scientists that have really, um, and there are many others that have done this very well where they've been able to bridge policy, academia and community, you know, and a lot of it is community gauged um, or practice-based, the practice-based research networks are another a uh, good network that's uh, uh, practice-based uh, networks across the country that are very community-based clinician oriented. You know, and those tend to be the people that service more the disparity and implementation science people that, oh, that uh, research the disparities. So those are important resources. Um, let's see, from Clementine, what do you think about you or your experience enables you to take on situations where the chances of success are low. And it's just persistence, it's hope. I mean, that's all I can say, persistence and hope. It's both of those, just really staying wedded to my belief that I'm, I was put on this earth to give people a voice who don't have a voice and to address some of these vulnerabilities and encourage people like you, the next generation uh, to pay it forward and, uh, and go, go, you know, continue the, the work. Um, could you describe the makeup of your of your cab in your community uh, advisory board? And yes, we compensated the members and they were community based organizations. They were social workers. They were clinicians. Um, they were survivors. So really a, a mix of all the audiences that we felt should be at the table. <clears throat> could you please repeat the website? Um, let me, uh, I don't, I mean, I, I'm free to, I think the slides will be posted somewhere, uh, will they, or? Um, I don't we can know. share slides with the registrants, yes. Okay, yeah, and, the, and the, the link will be in there. And I'm sure if you just, if you just um, Google UCSF, I think Nuevo Amanecer, which is N-U, um, N-U-E-V-O is the first word I'm on. It said is A-M-A-N-E-C-E-R. And I didn't say what that stands for, which is it translates into a new dawn. Um, but it, it should come up and all the materials um, are on there. Jackie just posted that web page link in the chat box. So. Okay, great. Thank you. And then how did you modify the language of the marketing and treatment? Ooh, that's a long process, Marisol, and a great question. Um, and I would say if you want more information, um, you can one, look at the materials because that will be really informative, you'll see. Um, but I'd be happy to you know, talk to you in more detail because it, it, it is a very iterative and back and forth and back and forth process with uh, all the community partners. Um, and Penelope asks, I'm watching the time. Okay, we have 10 minutes. We're, I'm trying to talk fast, sorry. 
Regarding M Health and telephone coaching, uh, the, yes, we provided the phone and we paid for the cell plans. Um, so again, it's that being practical and really knowing your community is so critical and what their needs are. And we really had to do a lot of hand holding. We had um, one of our research assistants was an angel and definitely was was basically on call and uh, even did a few a few home visits when um, people had problems either rebooting, you know, whatever, whatever was reinstalling the, the app and all that, um, or having the app talk to the Fitbit or whatever it was. Um, where did we get funding for the community, fact-finding community work? We actually, um, I'm trying to remember, uh, the, I mean, part of it, part of the pilot work was eventually funded by NCI for the mobile health things. But again, I think that was because it was an intervention. And by that time, we had been working in this area for a long time and shown that we knew how to work with this population and, and, and uh, maintain their participation. But early on, it was really difficult. So we ended up getting funded. Um, because I was in California, there's a California breast cancer research program that has a community based research um, mechanism. And so that's what we targeted and that funded a lot of my, as well as foundations, Komen Foundation and others um, that founded my early work on, um, on identifying the needs and doing the population-based survey. But some of it was seed money from NIH, but for the, you know, that, that was hard. It was a hard battle to convince them that this type of research is really worth investing in, and it you know it's still it's still not as easy as I would like, and I'm trying to change that. <laughs> um, what are some of the streamline ways to streamline the process of research funding to direct interventions? Okay, it's really about looking at uh, evidence based interventions, and there are different. There's one called R Tips R T I P S, and we're developing a portal too as well, but it's not available yet. Um, where these are behavioral interventions that you can search by, you know, the disease, by the population, by the type of health problem, and so forth. And it provides, you can, you can ask for, some of them actually have them, all the, per, all the manuals and everything, intervention materials, and it gives you the evidence of what outcomes were, health outcomes change, um, and all that. And so that's what our premise was. We start with those evidence-based interventions, which saves time because you know those things already improve health. We extracted the core components, and then we worked with our community to adapt that intervention for that specific context where we were going to be delivering the intervention. And that's how you, you, know, you streamline the process. Um, how has your transition from Julia shifted from research to administrative? Um, how was your transition and how would you suggest shifting in a, into a more administrative role? Ooh, that really depends on the context. I'd say, um, you know, it's having, it's developing those skills. Um, I won't undersell that I had had a significant amount of experience working with teams and managing teams. And I had worked in the private sector for a while. And, and I think all those skills really, were really important. You know, learning how to hire people, fire people, um, you know, give them really solid feedback on their performance to inspire people and motivate them to do well and adopt the missions and the values and, and create ownership over those. And those are skills that take time. And I think um, just uh, to develop. So. I don't know, I would just create internship opportunities for yourself or look for them where you can have those skills. And the second thing I would say is really make sure that whatever skills you wanna develop and needs you have professionally, that you start out with that. You say, this is what I wanna get out of this experience, either on the job, uh, if you're getting paid or in an inter internship and make that very clear um, because you're more likely to get it. As I said, if you don't ask for it, you won't, you know, there's no guarantee you're gonna get it. Um, how do you identify local partners? What I did in the first study, because it was more local to where I was, I knew all the community players because of all the community work I'd done. In the second, it was a completely, one was in the Central Valley, was one was at the border with Cal, you know, with Mexico, and the other one was on the coast, so they were all far away. So I just started cold, cold call. What I did is I looked at U.S. Census data to identify where the concentration of Latinos were, and then I looked at the cancer incidence data to look at incidence of breast cancer by geographic location. And that helped me narrow down the communities. And then the next step was 
the searches online for community organizations that were working either with can with like cancer and Latinos, or if that wasn't available with mental health and Latinos. And so then it was cold calling those organizations and developing the relationships and involving, involving them from the get go in writing the grant and developing the ideas for the grant. So it's a lot of work, um, but you, you know, you get help and if people are passionate and it's amazing the partnerships and the friendships, because I'm still friends with all those people and I keep in touch with them that you develop because you're all working toward the same ends. Um, does health insurance, uh, Sydney asks, play a role or present an obstacle? Um, yes, it does. And so uh, for our population, you know, um, most had health insurance, but it was because there's a, a program uh, in California where they can get emergency Medi-Cal or Medi Medicaid. Uh, it's called Medi-Cal in California. But we had to, you know, we had to make sure that they were enrolled in that program and work with our community partners and social workers at the hospitals as they were getting diagnosed to make sure they had access to that. You know, but our program was free, um, and the community organizations we worked with, their services were free, so that helped um, in terms of the actual program. Um, Neha asked, is there any work in progress for last stage of cancer patients, small income, income groups? Very, very little. So that would be your niche, Neha, if you want to work in an area that has very little scientific research or services to help that population. I remember being in a study, you know, palliative care for cancer patients, especially underserved, you know, vulnerable patients is a huge area of need. So I would encourage you to do that. You know, we did, I did an end of life intervention, but I wasn't the PI a long time ago. And I think we were like the only people even looking at that at that point. Um, so, and as Neha says, yeah, palliative end of life support, exactly. Um, and then uh, Sean, would you happen to have any more advice about how to prevent participant attrition um, in community-based research? I tell you, for us, it was all relationship-based and it really makes a difference. So your study team, whoever works, um, you know, uh, directly with that population in terms of the study, you know, for us, it was the interventionist and the recruiters and then the study coordinator was on our, the academic research team. But, you know, we were all Latinas, we were all bilingual, you know, we interacted with all the community organizations when a patient had a problem we were brought into the picture to try to help, um, you know, if it was issues of transportation, childcare, all those things. And so, you know, all my project director had to do was call the community interventionist and say, hey, um, we notice, you know, this patient has not responded to the phone calls to do the, the three month assessment. Do you happen to know what's going on? And they would know, they would say, oh, she went to Mexico because her father just died. And you know, I'll try to get a hold of her as soon as she gets back. So, I mean, it's it's that type of insider kind of connections that makes a difference. And they know, and also I say, the part I didn't say is that we fed back the, um, the results. We mailed every participant a, a low literacy letter and a, a diagram is showing like what the outcomes were. Um, and we also went back to each of the communities and did a town hall and presented the results. So I think all that says a lot for, you know, for how much we value their participation, which I think um, isn't always vocalized and um, expressed after a study. And anonymous, would you say that men are intimidate, intimidated by women who are better off than them? And do you think this is what leads to gender discrimination? That's an interesting story. Um, I would say it probably goes both ways and it just depends on the players, right? I mean, I'm sure that happens um, where, uh, you know, women have paid a price to get where they are because it is, is I think, definitely much harder uh, in terms of reaching, you know, high, higher, you know, in, in organizations where there are hierarchies and in reaching those positions that have more power, um, I think it's, it creates a, it creates power dynamics that are different. And, but it really depends on the people. You know, because I also think that my role as a woman in a position of power is to help men understand how to deal with women that are trying to further their careers. You know, and I do that daily and I'm not afraid and I do it in a, in a compassionate way. 
but I give them that feedback. If, if there's an occurrence where I feel, you know, the way you presented that may not have landed on open ears because you, because you might consider saying it this other way, you know? Um, and so, you know, I think it can go both ways and there's no easy answer. <laughs> So I think our, there's one last question. So I mean, it's 12, but let me just say, I'm, um, there's a person, Miriam, finishing a second master's in clinical social work who has an MPH. What do you think of best doctoral in social work or public health? You know, it depends what you wanna do. If you wanna, if you're a practitioner, I, I'd say either one of those is good. If you wanna do research, I would strongly recommend uh, epidemiology and public health because that'll give you the research methods and, um, and statistics that you can apply to any any research area, so and have strong rigorous research methods behind it. All right. Well, thank you all, and I appreciate your interest in all the questions. It was fantastic. I just wish I could see you all. It's so frustrating, but um, but I know you're there in spirit. And good luck to you all. Thank you so much for joining us today. It was so inspiring. Thank you. All right, everyone, have a good afternoon. Take care.